So the three of us walk into Charlie's office. Charlie's this little guy sitting behind his desk with stacks of CDs just covering his desk. He's on the phone in both ears, two <laughs> phones, talking to two people. Hold on. Yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah. All right. All right. Hold on. Sit down. I'll be with you in a second. So he gets off both calls finally. Jay, John, what's going on? They said, this is our friend, Scott. He drove us here. He lives next town over in Burlington. Oh, what's going on, Scott? So Jay, John, you know, how things? You playing the music, this and that. Like I was just an invisible guy at the time. So after a couple minutes, we're getting ready to leave. He says, so, so uh, it's so good to see you guys in town for the show tonight. And they look at each other like they had no idea any concerts were happening. We're not uh -huh. going into Boston. We don't have anything planned like that. They look at me. They're like, Scott, what concert? Charlie says, the boss. The boss is playing in Worcester. It's at the Centrum. Two shows. Tonight's the first show. And they look at me. They're like, how did you not tell us this, Scott? I'm like, I don't remember. I think I was home earlier in the summer and they announced it and tickets went on sale, but I wasn't, I wasn't get. I didn't know if I'd be there. I didn't get tickets. He says, hold on a second. He pull, he opens his drawer. He pulls out a stack of tickets this big, starts <laughs> shuffling through all the tickets, all different shows, all different artists, whatever. And he says, oh, throws down three tickets on the desk. My buddies look at each other with their jaws dropping. And I just reach over and grab the tickets up. I'm like, dude, we're going to Springsteen tonight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. Joining me today is um, Scott Green. Scott was on our round table and uh, raised his hand after and said, hey, I'd love to do a solo episode if you want to do so. Scott, welcome back to the show. Thank you. This is a great opportunity to talk about Springsteen and and all that goes with it. Thanks yeah. for having me on. No problem. So let's uh before I ask you a little about yourself, gotta know what what's your thought on the soul album? I to be honest, was not excited to okay. to hear that it's gonna be a a album of soul covers. And okay. I want new Bruce music, but I'm open minded and looking forward to to hearing it i've not heard the album i heard the single and yeah. i thought it was pretty cool so you know open-minded it wasn't yeah. my first choice for a new bruce album but we'll go with it and maybe get some new uh bruce and the band stuff in the future yeah and i would if he was going to do a series of american recordings like rick rubin and him get together i i would i would be happy if we could get them you know quicker like, you know, like, oh, well, let's do a gospel album and let's do, you know, let's do an Eastery band, then let's do a gospel album. Let's do something. So, yeah, I'm excited about it just because anytime we get new music, it's fun. Um, I get to enjoy new music and candidly, it gives me material for the podcast, right? Love it, like it, doesn't matter. Discussing it leads to conversations. Right, and exactly. And you know what? I don't want to be a selfish Springsteen fan and say, well, it's what I want. And I yeah. want a new E Street Band album. This is what Bruce wanted to do. Yeah. So I will take it at that and enjoy the music that he's putting out. And this was his take on these classics. Yeah, um, it's funny. My my partner and time, I do a Doctor Who podcast. And so Charles is a casual Bruce fan and always picks at me because I figure out a way to put Bruce Springsteen in a discussion of Doctor Who, right? Like he always jokes, okay, take a drink on the doc, you know, our next stop everywhere drinking game. And he said, really? He's doing a cover of soul albums? What tracks? And so I sent it to him and he sent back like, oh, and, you know, he named a couple of them like, oh, I think these will be the highlights. And so he, I think that's kind of cool that it may be a whole different audience that enjoy this. 
I didn't like the singer sessions mostly because he didn't sing the songs the way my dad sang them. <laughs> my dad mm -hmm. sang Froggy Went a Courtin, and that was one of our favorite songs. And Bruce did not sing it the way my dad did, so therefore I was not happy. I know that I missed out by not going to a singer session live because when I got the live in Dublin, I'm like, holy crap, that nice. that looks like it was a fun time. Yeah, that thing so, kicked ass. Yeah, so absolutely. All right, so... Scott, let's talk. So let's start at the beginning. Where did you grow up and what kind of music did your family listen to? Uh, well, so I grew up in Burlington, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, about 25 minutes northwest, the 128 belt for any uh, New Englanders that might know that area. My family did not. I didn't grow up in a musical household. I remember back to, um, you know, the the late 70s, early 80s uh, when I was growing up and my mom had a, you know, an old stereo turntable and a hundred LPs in a cabinet underneath the turntable. And we're talking Frank Sinatra, Ann Murray, Engelbert Humperdinck. Um, you know, it was, it was like the easy listening um, music. I kind of found my own way in, you know, middle school and then into high school growing up in the eighties with the eight, you know, the eighties music and then listening to the, the top 40 countdowns. And um, I was, I got really big into guys like Huey Lewis in the news and uh, Jay Giles band. And, and then I fell in love with, with Def Leppard. And uh, my first ever concert was in Worcester, Massachusetts at the Centrum and it was white snake and, and they opened up a uh, op great white opened up for them. So th that was my music. I, fell in love with Bruce Springsteen kind of late high school into early college. So we're talking late eighties, early nineties. And, you know, after I went to my first show, I, I was hooked and, and it wasn't even the E street band. I saw yeah. him on the lucky town tour yeah. in August of 92. And there's a whole story <laughs> of how that concert came yeah. about, but, but that's when I, I fell into my Springsteen fandom and and have gone on from there and it's been um 30 years do you remember why you discovered bruce to begin with and why you decided to start exploring his music i do i was a camp counselor and uh, over the summer um for it was the summer before i went to college and then my first couple summers during okay. college and that first summer uh, one of my co-counselors, uh, a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, I'd like to give a shout out to him, uh, Mark Miller. He uh, he passed away uh, a couple of years back uh, from complications from a, a many years after a liver transplant. And um, Mark let me borrow the live 75 to 85 uh, cassettes that he had. And I remember listening to those cassettes during an overnight in the woods that we had with all the kids it was something we did every every session and i'm like wow i mean i knew of bruce springsteen and his music and you know with the uh, born in the usa album and the, all the hype there in 84 85 he actually came and played uh some shows in worcester at the centrum in 1987 tunnel mm -hmm. of love tour uh, 87 or 88 i'm not exactly sure on the dates and i was a junior in high school then and i didn't go to those shows it's like i look back and like oh i wish i wish i did i went to white snake instead that year uh so so i have known about bruce yeah. i like the music i wasn't a huge fan and then when mark says just listen to this top to bottom and yeah. i did i'm like this is it was different live i didn't yeah. really know that so a couple things one are you a football fan I am. Okay. So I think that for us people that I think anyone, because I had a guy on who talked about seeing Bruce during that. I've seen the future of rock and roll tour. He didn't say he was there that night, but he saw him at the same time. And he's like, I just, there were so many other shows I could have gone before if I'd just known. And I'm like, okay, you're still chasing. I think it's like missing an extra point. You chase that point the rest of the game, often in football. I think as Springsteen fans, when like my first show was 2002, I'm like, think of all the shows I missed. What, mm -hmm. what was I thinking? So, right. yeah. Uh, the other thing is I, I, I don't, I, 
I have a, in my Springsteen laboratory, I'm working on a, um, a theory and I don't quite have it worked out, but there is a greater than normal chance that if you grew up on the East Coast, when I ask the question, how did you discover Bruce, a camp has something to do with it. <laughs> I am amazed, Scott, how many times say I had a counselor who loved Bruce. He played it all the time. We started listening. I had a roommate in my cabin that loved Bruce and started playing it. I it it is and it, it's it's East Coast only. I don't get that from people that are in you know from the West or the South, but it is more often than not your story i had a buddy i had a counselor and he they he had i mean it's almost like blind over the light right they hand darkness and you know two cds and like uh you know or just two cassettes and go oh check this out so you are in good company my friend that's great and, and think about it if i had gone with my buddies from junior year in high school to the show in worcester and seen the tunnel of love tour i'm a fan then i'm a huge diehard yeah. then and the camp story may not have even happened. Right. So yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, so you you've you've gotten the live. It it kind of piques your interest. So you said that you got to see the other band, and there was a story. So go ahead. Well, before I tell the story, I always like to preface this, and I know your answer. Um, but the amount of times you've seen Bruce perform live is not a fair barometer of how big of a fan you are. There are people, in fact, I had a round table with uh, three young women just about a month ago that have never seen the band live. They're all under 22. Two of them had gone to Broadway. The other one hasn't, but none of them have seen Bruce live. And, uh, you know, and one of them is the creator of Springsteen Hurdle, <laughs> you know, so they're all three just amazing fans so there are people just based on your age and geographical location and financial situation that can't see them so anyway you Understood. shared with me how many times have you seen them and then i'd love to hear that story of the first one sure well if i count correctly i've been to 30 brew shows okay and being a diehard for 30 years it just doesn't seem like a, a huge amount but you know i've not seen any other musician artist that many times I would say that um, it must be eight or eight or nine of those though were on the reunion tour. So there's yeah. a big chunk of my 30 from back in 99, 2000. And then I remember, you know, the river tour, I must've seen, you know, three or four shows. I know three of them were, were right here in the Northeast. So mm -hmm. there's some chunks and clusters of certain, certain tours that I saw more than often, yeah. more, more often than not. The story uh the yeah, story please. of my first show, I'd love to share it and I'll be as brief as possible. No, no, no. There, there is no need to be brief. This so, is set lusting Bruce. <laughs> set lusting Bruce. Um, I, I'm definitely in, into that. I'm a, uh, uh, going into my uh, senior year at Syracuse University, summer of 1992. And I stayed up in Syracuse and I didn't come home because I was working uh, at a, a, a classic rock radio station. Uh, 104.7 Kicks FM, classic rock in Syracuse. No longer, uh, no longer there anymore. They turned into a country station. And while I was working there part time, I was on the air doing weekend overnights. Got to play Bruce on that on that channel, which was pretty cool. Uh, a couple of buddies of mine from the Syracuse University radio station WJPZ Z89 were the program director and the music director, uh, my buddies Jay and John. So one weekend in August, we had plans to leave Syracuse and go hang out at my house for the weekend. They wanted to hit Boston, you know, scope around my old neighborhood and, you know, just take a couple days away from the Cuse. And they didn't have much going on at the college radio station on the weekend. Well, this radio station is one of the top college stations in the country. It's actually run by students and it's run just like a professional radio station with a GM, okay. TV, music director, promotions, you know, sports and news staff, everything. So 
John as a music director and Jeremy uh, as the PD, they were in touch with all the record labels and they had um, a relationship with the gentleman from Columbia Music. So we're driving uh, back to my house and uh, I'm on that aforementioned Route 128 outside of Burlington. Okay. We're going through Lexington and they said, hey, Scott, do you mind if we stop over at the Columbia Music offices it's right off the highway in Lexington. I said, oh, I know where that is. Sure. And we'll stop there for just a couple minutes. We want to see Charlie Walk. We'd like to say hi to Charlie Walk. So this guy, Charlie Walk, he must have been in his, I don't know, late 20s, early 30s at the most at the time. He's this executive in Columbia in the Northeast. Okay. So he's the guy that they dealt with for all the Columbia music that they wanted to that they wanted us to play on the radio station. We go into the office, We they check in, they say, hey, we're here from WJPZ in Syracuse. We want to say hi to Charlie. The receptionist says, you know, have a seat. We'll, we'll all check with him. A couple minutes later, they say, all right, guys, he's ready to see you. So the three of us walk into Charlie's office. Charlie's this little guy sitting behind his desk with stacks of CDs just covering his desk. He's on the phone in both ears, two <laughs> phones. Talking to two people. Hold on. Yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah. All right. All right. Hold on. Almost he's like finally, a cliche, right? Like goes, in a movie. Oh, guys, just sit down. I'll be with you in a second. So he gets off both calls finally. Jay, John, what's going on? They said, this is our friend, Scott. He drove us here. He lives next town over in Burlington. Oh, what's going on, Scott? So Jay, John, you know, how are things? You playing the music, this and that. Like I was just an invisible guy at the time. So after a couple minutes, we're getting ready to leave. He says, so... So uh, it's so good to see you guys in town for the show tonight. And they look at each other like they had no idea any concerts were happening. We're not uh -huh. going into Boston. We don't have anything planned like that. They look at me. They're like, Scott, what concert? Charlie says, the boss. The boss is playing in Worcester. It's at the Centrum. Two shows. Tonight's the first show. And they look at me. They're like, how did you not tell us this, Scott? I'm like, I don't remember. I think I was home earlier in the summer and they announced it and tickets went on sale, but I wasn't, I wasn't get. I didn't know if I'd be there. I didn't get tickets. He says, hold on a second. He pull, he opens his drawer. He pulls out a stack of tickets this big, starts <laughs> shuffling through all the tickets, all different shows, all different artists, whatever. And he says, Oh, throws down three tickets on the desk. My buddies look at each other with their jaws dropping. And I just, reach over and grab the tickets up. I'm like, dude, we're going to Springsteen tonight. So, so thank you, Charlie walk. So we get to the Centrum in Worcester. Uh, again, I've never been to a Springsteen show. The seats were on a lower level loge, like right next to the stage. And in, back in those days, it was a full, full set must've played for about two hours, took a half hour break. And then he came back and did like another hour and a half. So it was like two full sets. And Charlie came over during the show at some point, might've been intermission, just to check on all the people that he had given tickets to. And that night, it was just so much energy. It was amazing. I ended up getting a bootleg videotape VHS of the next night, which we didn't go to. So I kind of tell myself I had seen both shows. And that was my... Uh, doctrination into the amazing live Springsteen performance. It's the 1992, August. Four years later, I'm working in the auto parts industry for a friend of our family. Um, I took a, a half day. I went to Lowell because he was on the Tom Joad tour acoustic. I didn't have a ticket. It's completely sold out. But I heard about something called a drop line. And people had said, if you get there early, get in this line. And if they release tickets, you'll get them at face value and you might be able to get in the show. So I got there, I think around one in the afternoon, I was number 87 in the drop line. This is a small little Lowell Memorial Auditorium. And I waited and I waited and the show is getting ready to start. And probably quarter to eight, they started selling some tickets. The line's moving slowly. Uh, long story short, it was probably about 10 minutes after the show started. I got in, they called me, I bought my ticket. I don't know, it might've been like 20 or 30 bucks at the time. I don't remember. It was face value, good deal. Yeah. And I just had to wait 
uh, you think they only open the doors in between songs. So they, I'm waiting in the, in the lobby, waiting for the doors to open. I look over to my left down at the next set of doors and uh, Peter Wolf was waiting also to get in uh, to, to his seat for the next, the next song. So I ended up sitting, I think it was like 20th row on the floor center. I had a single seat by myself. So saw that that was great. And then my third shows moving forward were all five concerts at the Fleet Center, now the TD Garden in Boston on the reunion tour. Although, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I take that back. I went to Asbury Park for one of the rehearsal shows. Oh, how um, fun. In, in March 99. It was on the boardwalk, convention hall. That was the first time I ever saw the band. It was amazing. Uh, and then I actually kind of hosted all five of the shows in Boston on the tour later in August. Um, buddy of mine manages one of the um, the bar restaurants across the street, and we hosted the Lucky Town Digest pre-show party for all five shows. I had tickets to a couple of them. I found tickets to a couple of them. I ended up getting into all five shows, different seats, um, and it was just fabulous. And so now, you know, now we're so many years later, and. I can't wait to to see him on this upcoming tour. Yeah. Uh, do you have tickets? Do you have tickets for the new show? I have tickets to two out of the three arenas around okay. uh, in my neck of the woods. I'm, I'm, I don't have tickets for Boston yet, but I do have two tickets. I'm going to take my wife to Albany. And then I have one ticket to, which I believe, and I think I mentioned it on, on your, your round table there, yeah. the Mohegan sun. Yes. Where I hold, I hold that as a premium value because the arena is much smaller. Yeah. And I have a single for that. Although I might be going with a friend and might sell my ticket. Not sure yet, but I'll be there. So um so I have I have three for Dallas. Um, and it's my son's birthday. And he we usually for the past three or four years, we've tried to go uh before pandemic and then post pandemic, we try to go see a Mavericks game around that time because he, you know, he loves basketball. And um and so this year I'm like, well, y y your birthday is February 10th and Dallas, you know, Bruce is in, you know, Dallas on February 10th. And <laughs> my wife's like, what if he doesn't want to go see Bruce for his <laughs> birthday? I'm like, then we will celebrate his birthday a different day. <laughs> and of course, Chris is ecstatic. He's thrilled. Um, he's only seen him twice. And um, then we're all going to Tulsa to see him and then i have a houston and the only thing i don't have is austin and i was kind of waiting and my wife is like i like austin mm -hmm. i'm like can't we do a little getaway to austin she's more excited about going to austin and seeing sure. bruce again so yeah so we I, my plan is unless just something goes crazy to see all four you know that are in this area great so I, i'm ecstatic to see him i i'm looking forward to it um i i still think we're going to get and, and I'd love your opinion. I think we're going to get still a lot of letter to you. I think the new album will push Western stars kind of, I do not, I've like before, I thought we might get a couple of Western stars, but I think with, you know, this new one, we're going to get letter to you. And if they are going to do any, they'll do something from the cover album. What do you think? I agree with you. I mean, maybe if we get a Western star song, all right. I, I don't know that the crowd is yeah. going to be so into that. There are a couple of tracks on Letter to You I just absolutely love. Oh yeah, me too. I I I, I would love to hear Burn and Train open the show. I think yeah. it would just completely rock. Me too. Uh, Ghosts. I love Ghosts is a great song and, yeah. and kind of just different parts of that song is classic E Street yeah. band. And yeah, I, I think it would be great for them to throw in some Letter to You stuff. Well, and yeah, I think that. I do think we'll play that. I think he's dying to do that. I do think it'll be Ghost that opens. So I would have picked Burning Train. And uh, the guys on um, None But The Brave podcast, um, their theory is, their hope is that instead of Shout, they do one of these other covers to mix things up that they could do. And, and you know, while we're wishing, they pick three or four different ones and they rotate and that's the big closing, you know, instead of shout. So that would be fun. Maybe it's a new medley of uh, the covers. Yeah. 
Oh, soul card. that would, yeah, a new, uh, that would be cool. That would be very cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, you, you mentioned you worked in the car agency, you worked in the radio. What's your day gig? Yeah. Um, I'm like on my seventh career. <laughs> okay. Nothing wrong with uh, that. Yeah. No, I graduated from Syracuse uh, with a bachelor's in uh, broadcast journalism. I wanted to be, you know, the next uh, on-air talent, you know, in Chicago, yeah. but that didn't happen. Um, uh, my first job right out of college, I actually stayed in Syracuse for three years, but I was behind the scenes. I was a promotion director, which totally was fine. You know, I got to handle all the promotions and concert tickets and sure. and bar nights and, and drive the van and the big trailer we had, Wh whatever. That was cool. Anyway, I got into marketing. I was in marketing events for many years, um, burnt out, went back to school, got a master's in education, got my teaching certificates, taught middle school math for nine years, got burnt out, couldn't finish one school year about 10 years ago. And I got back into the business world. And for I just recently, uh, literally a day or so ago, celebrated my 10th year at Reminder Publishing, which is a local media group here in Western Massachusetts. And I'm the assistant sales manager and I sell uh, print and digital advertising. So that's my day gig and a whole bunch of other things on the side where I run a website called Prospects 1500 and I've got writers around the country. It's all about minor league baseball, top prospects in the game. Uh, we do top 50 ranks for every organization. So that's just something I do on the side. I'm, uh, I've been a club leader for the Syracuse University Alumni Club of Connecticut and Western Mass for the last yeah. six, seven years. So I do a lot. Um, and, you know, my wife tells me I have so many hobbies and Bruce is one of them. So how are my Texas Rangers farm team? If you, uh, as I put you on the spot, <laughs> It's not one of the best. That's what I was worried at, too at this time. Yes. Uh, yeah, they've got a couple nice blue chip guys. I mean, they actually have two of the best pitching prospects in baseball, uh, which we could see them in the next year or so with Jack Leiter and Kumar Rocker. And yeah, are, right. They're both from that the same college, right? And Vanderbilt, yes. Yeah. And the thought, I mean, you're it's almost as a Ranger fan. You'd, be, you'd really want to think that you could get that lucky, that you could get both of them being solid players. Forget thinking about them being superstars, just to get really two solid inning eating, you know, pitchers. But I hope um, they this was a weird year for the Rangers as we talk a little baseball. Right. They, they fired the manager. They fired the, you know, the the long time. Uh, you know, general manager. Um, so, and it's all new, you know, there's, they're, they're looking for who's going to be the new manager. Uh, they now have, um, you know, a, a new GM. And so we'll, we'll see what they do. I'm uh, they had a very interesting draft where um, they took Kumar uh, third overall, which was kind of a surprise after he uh, was drafted. I think it was 10th overall yeah. year before the Mets didn't sign him. He actually played independent ball right uh, hour and a half from me outside Albany um, with the Tri City Valley Cats, I believe. Okay. And uh, that was just to get kind of ready and play some ball before the draft happened in July. So then they drafted Kumar in the first round, third overall. There was another player, and that was projected to be a first round guy, but his signability was a big question mark. Mm -hmm. And the Rangers got him in the fourth round, Brock Porter. So he's another great talent. So they have some really cool pitching prospects and some interesting hitting prospects. I think the organization's on the rise. I would ask you to check out our website and pretty soon in the off season, you'll get a brand new Rangers top 50 from uh, my, my good buddy, Byron, who lives out in the Dallas area. He's heading up our Okay. Rangers coverage. I will check that. Yeah. I'm excited about Chris Young. I, I think that, um, you know, John Daniels had a good run and, you know, but I think after a while it's time to change. And so, uh, thank you. I itch my little baseball. I, uh, I'm, uh, it, um, one of my loves, I, 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 I love, there's nothing better than just going out to the ballpark and just watching them. And, uh, 
I'm I have a I, question for you, yeah. Jesse. Have you done the lazy river in Frisco? I have not. I always hear them talk about it. That seems like it would be fun. Yes. Um it, I, I have to also. So yeah, I will tell you in and you're going to you're going to tell me duh but um if someone said okay i'll give you free tickets to frisco or i'll give you free tickets for the rangers i'm picking frisco because it's a little bit smaller the the concessions are just slightly cheaper and it's just so intimate it's a really nice little ballpark there and it just I, that there seems to be an energy to it. I mean, I love going to see, you know, going out that there's the new ballpark that the Rangers have, mm -hmm. but I, I really, I agree with you. Minor league baseball is fun. I have to give a shout out if, if I can, I grew Please. up a Red Sox fan. I'm a diehard. I mean, God, I've been going to Fenway since yeah. I was five, five years old, living in Eastern and Western mass. Now I'm an hour and a half, two hours with traffic. Yeah. I'll be in Hartford seeing the Yard Goats Double A, same same level as Frisco, yeah. or an hour drive to Worcester to see the the Worcester Red Sox Triple A, brand new ballparks, uh, brand new ballpark, two years old in Worcester. Hartford opened just about five years ago. Yeah, I will do those nine times out of ten before I go into Boston and spend you know hundreds of bucks with the, with the family. But yeah, it, it is such a great time. Yeah, it really is. And it just, it, it is, it, it's just a lot of fun. All right. So um, now that we got off, I, I will, we will um, go ahead and give your website and then I will include it in the show notes. You can send me a link and I'll include it. But awesome. if people want to know about minor league, do you have it real quick? Yeah, it's prospects 1500 P R O S P E C T S one five zero zero prospects 1500.com and a lot of our content and uh, interaction and activity is also on twitter at prospects 1500 very nice thank you all right so yeah um any thoughts on the hitting 62 the oh, that record was awesome that was awesome yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was so cool and i tweeted it last night i said Good. so classy for the rangers fans to be chanting uh, MVP yeah, for, yeah, for Aaron they, Judge. That yeah. was really cool. Yeah, that is very cool. All right, so back to Bruce. Um, talk to me. Um, you already mentioned how much you love Letter to You, and uh, I have a soft, I will always have a spot, soft spot for that album because of the context when it came out, right? We had, we had spent a year, it, 2020 was truly a bad year for a lot of us for a lot of reasons. And uh, for this this shining new album to come out, and uh, it was just really special. But are there other albums or songs that mean a lot to you? Yeah, and you know what? I don't know that I have a favorite album. I have yeah. my favorite songs, you know, sure. and, and Jung Jungle Land is my favorite song. <clears throat> okay. I love the Born to Run album. I don't know that it, I would say it's my favorite album just because I like so many of them. Um, Incident on 57th Street is another song I absolutely love. And for years and years and years, I never got to see it live. And then I finally, the first time, I think it was in Hartford um, back a few years ago that that they played it. And then I, I, I saw it again. I, uh, I think it might've been at, uh, was it the Gillette Stadium show? I, I can't remember. I got to finally see Incident a couple of times and it was great. After what the country went through with 9-11, The Rising was a, also a really important album for me, I think for Bruce and for all of his fans. Um, and sometimes when I listen to it, I still get choked up and I just have tears in my eyes listening to things like You're Missing and Into the Fire. It's just so powerful. So, you know, I, I wanted to mention those three albums. No, I'm glad you did. And um, I, since my first show wasn't until 2002, the only song that I've heard at every show is The Rising. Mm -hmm. um, when he was doing Devils and Dust here in Dallas, he didn't do Born to Run. Um, and so, because most people would guess, oh, Born to Run would be the song you heard the most. No, The Rising is the song I've heard every show I've attended. And um, I agree with you. Um because of everything that happened in 9-11 and 
that telethon, you know, that fundraiser where you open to him and Patty and everyone singing My City of Ruin, mm -hmm. you know, and then with The Rising being my first live show, that's always got a special place in my heart. And uh, I, you know, I like many people, I listen to it every 9-11 and just kind of is part of my tradition of going through that. So yeah, a great, great choices. Um, so you mentioned incident. Are there other songs you're chasing that yes. you, okay. Give me, give me your, give me your bingo card, your wish list. You mentioned it earlier. The name of the podcast. Yeah. None but the brave. I would yeah. love to hear that song. I'm, I, I don't think he's played it many times live. Right. A couple, couple uh, recordings I think I've heard of, but that's one song that I'd, I'd love to hear. Um, uh, yeah, Prove It 78. I actually got lucky a couple times once at Fenway in, in 2012, actually during the uh, Fenway Park 2012 nice. show, which was which was great. Um, and, and I think at Gillette Stadium at the last United States show mm -hmm. uh, in September of 2016. Yeah. Um, I would say that I can't think of many more that I'd that I've really been chasing. Yeah. You know, it was, it was incident for so long. None but the brave. I'd love to. Oh, and yes, one other one, it's a tracks tracks song. Um, I want to be with you is a song that I'd love to hear. I know he did it like once on the reunion tour once or twice. And then he did it once overseas, I think in Europe uh, last tour. Yeah. I love that tune also. And yeah, and that's, I'd say I'm chasing that one also. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, other stories from tours or songs of experiences in fandom, anything else you want to share um, as we continue our fun discussion? Well, uh, it was, I, I mentioned that uh, I caught that rehearsal show in 1999. Yeah. Uh, it, it was back in the days of, of you could only get tickets by calling Ticketmaster and I there was that email newsletter called Lucky Town Digest, and that's where I got a lot of my information. But we, people didn't really uh, get onto the computers a lot or check emails over the weekend back then. It was still fairly new at the time, and I only had email on my work computer. And I went into work on a Monday morning in Boston, and uh, there was a, a email with the Lucky Town Digest from over the weekend. So I was not one of the first people reading this. And as I'm reading this newsletter, it talks about tickets going on sale, limited number for these rehearsal shows in Asbury Park for this new tour they're going on. I'm like, all right. So I'm reading this. Tickets go on sale Monday morning at 10 a.m. by calling you know, your local ticket master or the ticket master in New Jersey yeah. number that you used to do that back then you would try to call like if i was trying to get tickets for boston i would call like new york or chicago ticketmaster because not as many people would be right. calling ask if they can bring up that arena yeah so i'm reading this newsletter and tickets go on sale 10 a.m. and as i look at my computer time it says like 10:22 i'm like oh my god they already went on sale so i picked up the phone and i called i got through and I asked this woman and I called the Boston Ticketmaster number because the shows were in New Jersey. Yeah. And I asked her if she could bring up Convention Hall, New Jersey. She brings it up. She says, all right, I have that show here. Yes. March 18th, Asbury Park, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, the rehearsal. Uh, how many do you want? And I'm like, it's you have tickets. It's not sold out. Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, I can give you uh, I can give you general admission. I could give you reserved. I didn't know back then that the pit was like a ticket. A lot of diehards wanted to yeah. stand and be up in front of the stage. Right. I wanted to have seats that right. I was guaranteed to have seats. I didn't know any better. So I took, I told her to reserved, please. And I got him. And I, I called my buddy up at the time who was in Western mass in Springfield. Now in the area that I'm living in now, yeah. so he was working at a rock station in in Springfield, I say, dude, this Thursday, we're driving down to New Jersey to see Bruce and the E Street Band. I never, ever thought I'd be saying that. And so um, that's how I got those those uh, first tickets for that rehearsal show. I went down to New Jersey 
and saw two of the 15 shows at the Continental Airlines Arena, uh, which which basically kicked off the tour. Yeah, um, it was late July, mid to late July when he started. I think I the first two that I went to in early August and I just you know, I, I went by myself. I met people there in the parking lot. I went to visit a buddy of mine who lives down the shore past Atlantic City. Uh, shout out to my buddy, John Reed and Beasley's Point. And and um, then later that month, the five shows in Boston. Uh, and then after I met my current wife in February 2000, um, we were we were dating. You know, yeah. We weren't even engaged yet. And I got tickets to one of the two shows in Hartford in May of 2000 and took her to that. And uh, not the best, not one of my top 10 shows. And we were sitting way up behind the stage in the balcony. Uh, and I guess the other show in Hartford, that was, that tour was epic. Yeah. So we were at the other show. Uh, but that, that reunion tour for me was something that I'll never forget. You know, met so many cool people. Uh, created a lot of, of, you know, long relationships. There are people that I met on that tour. I'm still in touch with, um, you know, 26 years later. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do the math right. 23 years later. Yeah. You know, that is one of the beauty of, you know, I'm lucky now because I couldn't have done this podcast before social media, but because of social media now, then I do get to connect and you, you build a, a relationship and you, and you, you start becoming, you feel like people are friends because you guys have Bruce together and then you've been on the podcast and you kind of share some things. So yeah, I, there is a lot to dislike about social media mm -hmm. and there is a lot of ugliness out there, but I do always want to also give share that there is a lot of joy out there and there is a lot of beautiful things that I do get to visit and talk to people about, you know, Bruce and other musicians. Exactly. Yeah. yeah I mean, I have one other quick story from the Please. reunion tour and one of the shows in Boston, I don't remember which show it was, but the pre-show parties that I hosted uh, at the harp and uh, shout out to my friend, Jamie, who manages the harp. They're still there. If you're ever in Boston, anybody, uh, before a Celtics or Bruins game, go across the street for dinner before the, the game at the harp okay. and you'll be very happy. So there was a guy, uh, his name is Mike Wortelli. I think uh, he they call him the rocket. And he was a Bruce impersonator kind of. And okay. he, he was this young guy that looked like a young Bruce okay. with, the, with the beard and, and his face, facial expressions. And uh, you would, you would look at, this guy mike rocket mm -hmm. and uh, you could see a young bruce and he played at the harp uh, before one of the shows and then after the concert we went back over there the guy actually didn't have any place to stay and he drove back to stoneham massachusetts followed me and i let him stay in my apartment that night with his girlfriend and that was a whole different story yeah um and you know the next morning is like take care mike you know it was it was great hosting you you sound awesome i'll see you at the next show just back in the day when i was you know i was young and stupid and single and and yeah oh, yeah come on stay at my place <laughs> well he was a bruce fan you figure he was, a, he was a right? bruce fan a bruce he was a musician fan. and yeah. and uh that was fun yeah that that does sound fun that sounds great so um your lovely bride she a casual fan she a big fan she's a casual fan okay you know she she's been to a couple shows we celebrated our uh anniversary at uh, bruce on broadway oh nice a few years back which was the last bruce show I, I saw probably the last bruce show a lot of people sure seen have seen and uh she you know that was just an amazing experience first in, run or uh, the second run first run okay. it was one of the first shows it was october yeah. 14th and i think he started early october yeah so uh she's she's been a couple times and sh she is a fan she's not a diehard and she will right. enjoy when we go to albany but she's yeah. not going to go to three or four shows 
Yeah. I yeah. I, I, I'm and actually, I'm a little surprised Linda wants to go to Austin. I think it is just for an Austin trip because, you know, going to Dallas and going to Tulsa, I would think she'd be like, okay. Um, so we'll see though. She did. Um, she watched the letter to you documentary with me and she did say, Oh, I, I like that song. Oh, I like that song. So, you know, if they're going to play a lot of letter to you, hopefully, you know, that'll, that'll get her going. So good. Tiffany did go with me to see the film Western stars was not her favorite experience. You know, yeah. Be honest. It wasn't my favorite experience mm -hmm. either, but you know, she knew that I'm such a huge fan. She wanted right. to experience that with me. Did not and care for the film. You didn't I, I care. Thought, I thought it was, it was okay. It, just, okay. it wasn't, wasn't my favorite. I enjoyed the stories before mm -hmm. each performance yeah. almost more than the performance. Interesting. The performances. Um, you know, she's, she's just, she, she loves what Bruce represents and the mm -hmm. fact that he's got this great relationship with Obama and, you know, and what he's done to speak out against, you know, other people or for the country. And yeah. She's a huge fan and proponent of what he is for. And yeah. so, so she's, she supports my fandom and dieheartism. That's good. That is very good. Um, I, uh, after we were recording, I'll tell a fun story about something else. Uh, so uh, anything I else I should have asked you, Scott, that I haven't, is there another story that I'm forgetting to ask you? I'm sure there is. Okay. And I'm going to call you, you know, later yeah. tonight or okay. next yeah. week and I say, yeah, I forgot hey, about this. Well, I, know, I've covered a lot of it. Yeah, Thank you, you know, um, I don't know if you know this. I do another, I, you're welcome to come back. I do um, an episode called Songs of Your Life. And um, once again, I'll tell you after the show, uh, after record, because my audience doesn't need to hear this again. All right. So let's talk the Mary question. So if you're a friend of Scott or you support minor league baseball and you're here because you want to hear uh, Mr. Green talk about his other passion, um, I end every question with every episode with the Mary question. Uh, Jay Armstrong is a recently retired English teacher from the Philadelphia area. And he would take his seniors and they would spend two days breaking apart Thunder Road. They would look at all the lyrics. They would talk about the themes. They would compare it to Robert Frost and other American poets. And at the end of the two days, he asked the question, does Mary get in the car? So Scott, that is your question. Does Mary get in the car at the end of Thunder Road? No. Okay. So I thought long and hard about this and okay. I, I look back at the, the lyrics to the song and I listen to the song and maybe this is one of those instances where, well, you have to picture what might happen. I compare it to the end of the Sopranos where the screen goes black uh, and sorry, I might've spoiled that for people watching the show. Now you can rewind and decide not to listen if that happens. Yes. <laughs> so, um, you ain't a beauty, but hey, you're all right. Well, so you don't think I'm really gorgeous. You don't think I'm the most beautiful girl in your eyes. I'm just, I'm all right. And well, it is a town full of losers and you are one of them. So yeah, you do want me to climb in. I'm going to pass. And that's my take on it. That's That's how I interpret what happened. You know, he wants to take this girl and go out on the road. And I think she passes. I I love that answer. Um, about 60% say, yes, she does. About 40% say she doesn't. So it is not clear cut uh, with my audience. And that's a great explanation. I, I love well, 60, that. 60, 40 is pretty close. I was actually thinking it might've been more like 75, 80 who say yeah. yes, but 60, yeah. 40 is pretty close. Yeah, there is a lot of people that have, a lot of different reasons about she's too afraid or, you know, my wife says the same thing, you know, hell no, I'm not getting the car with him. He's, he, he didn't think I'm attractive. <laughs> F him, you know? All right. So, exactly. so Scott, if someone wants to reach you, what's the best way? The best way is to hit me up on Twitter at Scotty ball game. It's S C O T T Y underscore ball game, B A L L G A M E. Um, you can find me through prospects 1500 also, um, 
that's the best way to reach me. I I'm on there a lot, and I uh, I would love to you know meet a lot of other you know uh, fans of your show and and Springsteen fans and um, have have meetups you know before the concerts and even just to have have dialogue and chatter uh, in in group space, which is nice. So I would I'd love to hear from people and thank you again for for letting me talk Bruce and other stuff with you. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I, I want to have you on again. I, I'm given a serious thought to, you know, in November when the CD drops to kind of do a round table, the same we did about the ticket, just get, you know, a bunch of people to talk about first thoughts and everything in the album. So I absolutely, I'm going to, you're going to hang on after I say goodbye and we can give you some thoughts on how you can come again for now. Listeners go see your doctor, go get vaccinated, uh, go get boosted. Let's all be kind to each other because that's how we're going to get through this. Thank you, Scott. Thank you listeners. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. This podcast is made possible because of my wonderful patrons. I want to thank Randy Brown, Rob Barnett, Crystal Strong, Bella Pori, John Munson, Betsy Hodges, Levi Petrie, Stephen Malio, Steve Rogers, Dale Hozak, Terry Smith, Anna Lynn, Chris Bloom, and Mary Thomas. I appreciate all of y'all kicking in your hard-worn cash to help me spread the good news of Bruce Springsteen's music. I love y'all. Doing a podcast at times can be a one-way conversation, and I hate that. So please let me know what you like and don't like about the work I'm doing. You can reach the podcast via email at setlustingbruce at gmail.com. The show is on Twitter, at SetLustingBruce, and my personal Twitter is at DFW. You can support the podcast by subscribing via your favorite podcast player and leaving us a review. The more reviews we have, the easier it is for people to find us. And please tell a friend about the podcast, especially if they love Bruce or music, because it will make a difference. You just heard the fun talking, hard rocking, music loving, album ranking, fan thinking, joy spreading, lyric reading, story sharing podcast that is the one, the only, Set Listening Bruce. The theme for Set Listening Bruce was written by David Rosen, used by permission.